And welcome, friends, to this edition of The Grace Hour. We're broadcasting live here from our studios, which are located at the home of the Greater Grace World Outreach, right here in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland. Great to be with you, friends, on this very sunny Wednesday morning here in Baltimore. We hope that the weather is pleasant where you are, but even if it isn't, God's given you a pleasant spirit. So we hope that you will stay with us for the next hour and enjoy today's Grace Hour broadcast. Been a great theme this week. We're talking about our emotions and how we can make sense of all of these emotions and feelings. Uh, certainly it is a challenge for all of us um, because as someone once said that when God made us, uh, he, when it comes to emotions, he made us millionaires. We've got plenty of them and lots of them and how to manage them and how to bring them under the control of the Holy Spirit certainly is a challenge for all of us. But we have really enjoyed our two previous broadcasts this week, and I can assure you, friends, you will enjoy today's Grace Hour broadcast as well. The message will be brought by Pastor Bruce Wright. Pastor Wright is a staff member here at the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore, also one of the elders in our ministry. But he also pastors the Greater Grace Church of the Chesapeake up in Harbor de Grace. I hope I said that correctly. My wife often tells me I don't pronounce the name of that town correctly. But great to have him in the studio, and uh, you'll be certain to receive a message from him that will encourage your heart as he talks about the whole thought of godliness with contentment. And we know that that results in great gain. His message coming up in just a couple of moments. We want to welcome everybody. Listening live in gracehour.org, YouTube Live, Facebook Live. A pleasure to be with all of our friends and our listeners around the globe. And uh, we look forward to having you join us also when we open the phone lines today. Grace Hour affords you, its listeners, the opportunity to participate in the broadcast. And we hope that many of you will do just that. The phone lines, when they're open, you can pick up that phone, dial one of these numbers, and join us live. Toll free in all of North America. That number is 800-338-7060. And if you're joining us here in the local Baltimore area, you would dial that local number, 410-483-3700. And again, we'd be thrilled to have you with us as you can join us with your comments, questions, testimonies, counseling needs, prayer requests. And uh, again, always such a, a pleasure to have you be a part of our broadcast. Our podcast also goes live on the following platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Audible, and Stitcher, and that's not even all of them, friends. So you can listen to The Grace Hour on any of those platforms that you choose to. We're just thrilled that you are with us this morning and uh, hopefully have the opportunity to stay with us for the full hour-long broadcast as we can continue to develop this theme. We do want to mention before Pastor Wright begins his devotional message today that this being Wednesday, we have our Wednesday evening service here at the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore. It begins at 7 p.m., and everyone is welcome. And we hope that if you have visited us before, you'll come back and join us again. If perhaps you have never visited us before, we invite you to come on, join us, a time of fellowship, a message from the Word of God, a time to worship God, a time to exalt His name together with other believers. And it's always such a a treat to be able to gather with other believers for that distinct purpose of, again, exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. Because think about it, when we worship him, what are we doing? (laughs) The best thing we could do for ourselves, taking our eyes off of ourselves, putting them on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that always results in many, many benefits and blessings. So let's turn it over to our guest today in our studios, Pastor Bruce Wright. Thank you, Pastor Love, and uh, our Grace Hour audience, always a great audience. You know, I'm always blessed by the text messages, the phone calls, more phone calls perhaps today if we can get to our phones. But um, yeah, this theme about uh, contentment, and we're going to look at it a little bit. I, you know, I was given this subject in, uh, you know, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, but there's much to this that we won't be able to go into unless you bring it up in the questions and comments that that could happen. Um, because it really describes the, 
the kind of temporal realities that we are living in as human beings, as members of the human race, God created us to live in this world in time and space, but that is also, of course, preparation for eternity, where there will be no more time and space will not be the right measurement. Because it says here in, uh, in verse 7, well, actually our verse that we're going to pivot off of is verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain, or another translation says, is a great advantage, and we're going to see how that works. But verse 7 says something quite interesting. It says, for we brought nothing into this world. I'm sure you all understand that. Came in naked, going to go out. Well, maybe we'll be dressed up and put in the box, and you know, three-piece suit and a bow tie. But regardless, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. But then verse 8 says this, having food and raiment, clothing, let us there with be content. Now, that's, that's kind of an interesting topic if you want to jump into that, because it's simply saying, uh, be content if you have something to eat today. Be content if you have clothes today or appropriate clothing. I was kind of thinking of this, you know, if I if the temperature was, uh, you know, below 32 degrees and I had to go outside, I would be thankful and content that I had gloves um, as well as, you know, coat, scarf, hat, whatever else. And so this is not really describing, you know, just kind of settle for poverty, you know, hand to mouth living. No, this is being appropriately provided for. And we're going to see the source of that provision in just a moment. But, what does this mean, godliness with contentment? And we said it like this some time ago, that contentment has everything to do with content. Like, what is the content of my soul? What is the content of my inner life? Because people think that they're going to find contentment in things or in places or in people. And it just cannot be found there. In fact, you're not only going to be discontented, as we're going to look at in a moment, you're going to frustrate the grace of God, which is our provision under the heading of godliness. And I want us to think godliness is not religion. Mm-mm. Godliness is not self-righteous, you know, uh, goody two-shoes, you know, being the best that you can be. Godliness could be simply understood as God-likeness, God-likeness. Well, what is God-likeness in the believer, in, in the heart of a believer? It's going to be God, the Holy Spirit, who is not frustrated. He's not being resisted. He is uh, permitted by your volitional decision, i.e. being filled with the Holy Spirit, to have governmental reign in the soul and in the heart of the believer inside of you. This is why when the scriptures say that we have this, what, treasure inside of an earthen vessel, well, that's, that's really the key, isn't it? But don't we put so much attention on the clay pot? You know, it's cracked, it's chipped, it's, you know, discolored, it's old. <laughs> you know, we try to retain that. But no, it's the treasure that is the key. And so godliness is the least aspect of any kind of religious concept that anyone would ever have. It is when a believer is simply filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and having that governmental, as we've been taught so beautifully by Pastor Stephens, governmental doctrine, yes, operative in the soul. Well, why does the Bible say that this is a great advantage or a great gain? Well, because the cosmos, the world system, okay, is oriented the other way. We're going to see this shortly. That the world system, and we're not talking about creation as God created the heavens and the earth, but we're talking about the operational um, premise you know, the, the, the things that are trendy, the things that are prioritized, you know, the, 
the uh, fears, the phobias, the, the kinds of things that press upon a believer or press upon humanity in its entirety, and people experience this cosmic pressure, this cosmic world system. In fact, Jesus Christ said so simply, he said, in this world you will have pressure. You know, tribulation is not things, it's a pressure. Thalipsis is the Greek word there, and it, it literally means a ongoing, continuous pressure. Well, if I could live separated apart from the pressure that comes from the cosmic system on a daily basis, I, man, I am, I, that's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing, and we want to take a look at this. So Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 and 6. And we want to look at the fact that this godliness, which will result in contentment, is provided. Provided. I don't have to go look for it. I don't have to, I can't manufacture it up. I can't fake it out. But it's provided by Jesus Christ himself. So he says, let your conversation, good King James word for lifestyle, let your lifestyle be without covetousness. And may I just pause for a minute? You know, covetousness is not often touched upon in pulpits today. And I think that we give covetousness a pass, you know, as far as sins are concerned, or, you know, we give it a pass as far as its operation because it has some productive attributes, but we got a warning here. Don't let your life be full of covetousness. Then it says this, and be content with such things as you have. Well, what things does a believer have? Well, it's not talking about his home, his car, clothes on his back. I mean, those are logistical things, and logistical grace is a beautiful provision when God provides it. But what he's really talking about is our provision is God himself. Number one. Number two, the Holy Spirit. Number three, the Word of God. Number four, the body of Christ. Number five, a eternal purpose. What? Yes, an eternal purpose. This is what we have through the provision of God-likeness. It is not that, you know, otherwise I'm going to be like discontented if I'm a Christian living in the world guarantee you, you're going to be discontented. But thank you, Lord, that we can um, have you as our provision. Then he says this, for I will never leave you nor forsake you. So this is an assurance, friends, that even in your worst moment, day, hour, week, month, (laughs) however that might, how, you know, the duration of that might be, the Lord Jesus Christ cannot and will not leave us or forsake us, okay? And why is that a a gain or why is that a great uh, asset? Because in verse 6, so that we, it says, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Now, you know, I I think of it so often, uh, you know, we, you know, my my job is my helper. What What do you mean by that? Well, you know, my job pays my bills. Well, no. The Lord provided you with the life and the ability and the the capacity to do that job, whether good, bad, or otherwise. You know, people change their jobs like they change, uh, you know, their hats if they're wearing one. (laughs) That's an inside joke, friends. We're all enjoying that. Uh, Because what? They're discontented with the job. But, you know, what were they looking for? What were they expecting? What were they relying upon? No, no, no. The Lord is your helper, okay? And I will not fear what man shall do to me or not do for me. If I'm looking at people and they are not coming through for me, I'll be discontented. I'll be upset. And uh, this is this is the basis of it. So what is a second aspect of godly contentment. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and this is beautiful, verse 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound. Man, grace is going to run you down. Grace is going to overflow. 
grace is coming to you perpetually, continuously. Can I think of that? Yes, I can. You know, when I woke up this morning, I said, thank you, Lord. Your mercies are new today. Great is your faithfulness, your consistency. Great is your provision because I, I got to have it. I got to have it because the cosmic system is not going to provide what I have need of on a daily or moment by moment basis. I love Isaiah 27, three, you know, it says that he, we are his garden and that God keeps it or he protects it. But then it goes to say, and he will water it. What? Moment by moment. Yeah. Isn't that good? We used to think living day by day was the equation, but no, now we, through the filling of the Holy spirit, we live moment by moment with this ongoing provision, the river of grace abounding, abounding towards you. So that what? That you always, come on, that's what it says in the King James, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, always having all sufficiency in all, and yet you may abound to every good work. You know, so often as believers, we, we calculate our weakness and we calculate our need and we calculate our deficits and the things that we don't have. And thus we say, well, I can't do that. I, you know, I don't have, you know, fill in the blank. I don't have, you know, money. I don't have good health. I don't have intelligence. I don't have uh, the right friends. I don't have the right connections. Well, none of that, none of that could be a substitute for the provision of godly grace that is abounding toward us. Don't let your life be with covetousness. See, because what does covetousness do? Principally, a lot of things, but we're just going to emphasize one thing. It looks for something that it does not have while ignoring what one does have. Let me repeat that again. Covetousness is looking at what I do not have and trying to pursue it to get it using my life's time, energy, and resources but I forsake or leave off acknowledging what I already have. So if the believer has the word of God, has the filling of the Holy Spirit, has the plan of God the Father, has the body of Christ, and uh, has an eternal perspective and viewpoint, my gosh, like why would I want to leave that? Well, because I'm a human being and I'm prone to forsake the very thing That is God's provision, and we all understand that. But thank God for rebound, and I just get right back into it and receive, continue to receive what God has for me. Then I was thinking of this, you know, um, uh, wow. You know, Jesus taught this thing about being the helper, the helper, God being the helper of the disciples. And how did he explain this? Well, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 35. Um, he's telling the disciples, I want you to go from town to town and don't, don't pack a lunch. Don't pack a, you know, an extra pair of sandals. Don't, you know, no script, you know, that story. And then he asked them this question in Luke twenty two thirty five. he says, and he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, did you lack anything? Wow. And you know what their answer was? And they said, not a thing, Lord, nothing. Wow. You know, the contentment that we're talking about, friends, is inside of you. And when I fellowship and commune with the new nature, the new man, the new fellowship, the new Christ that's born in me, born again in me and born again in you, I derive the abundance of grace that's towards me. And, uh, and that's awesome. Then I want you to think of this, Proverbs 30 and verse 8. Here's a great prayer. I think every single one of us can pray this prayer, and it is a prayer. It says, Lord, remove far from me vanity and lies. You know, so many people get, you know, strung out behind pursuing something that cannot deliver them, cannot bless them, cannot encourage them, cannot lift them up, but they pursue it because they've been told a lie. They've been told, this is, this is what you need. This is what you ought to have. 
this is how you ought to be. And we say, yes, I, I, I would like that. Well, hallelujah, we can be delivered from vanity, emptiness, and lies. Then it goes on to say, God, give me neither poverty nor riches. Now, you know, a lot of people say, I, man, if I was rich, you know, if I hit the lottery, if I got a million dollars tonight, I could do this, that, and the other thing. You know one thing that you would do if you did get that big money all of a sudden? You would not be able to sleep. <laughs> you know, the Bible tells me that not only do riches take wing and fly away, <laughs> I think we all have seen that happen, but that the wealthy man loses his sleep worrying about his possessions, worrying about who's going to steal it. I, you know, who, I, I don't want to lose it, you know, and I, you know, people expect me to give it away, give it all away. No, we'll see. Some of us, we've already been delivered by that, not because we're impoverished, but because we don't have the riches. But also, poverty is not an indication of spirituality. Poverty is a lack of tying in and trusting the Lord as my helper. Okay, so feed me, it goes on to say in 30, uh, chapter 30 and verse 8 of Proverbs, feed me with food convenient for me or that which is appropriate for me. Now, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you, uh, you know, what, what will fill you, satisfy you and meet you? Christ knows that. I don't know that. You don't even know that. But it's going to be distinctly different from what I would be filled with. Doesn't mean that we're different in essence, but it does mean that we, we have a tailor made provision from Jesus Christ. And he knows our frame. Yes, that we are but dust. So he does something very specific and very unique and very personal in meeting my needs so that I am not leaning upon my own understanding. I'm not trying to get something that I don't have and forsake that which I already do have. There's covetousness, but I can rest in the provision of God. And that's what Titus, 1 Timothy 6, 8, and we come full circle, says, and having food and raiment, yes, let us there be content. Well, we'll look at uh, maybe during this, uh, the other part of the broadcast here, what it means to be discontent. What is, what, you know, what happens when a person is living in discontentment? Doesn't mean that they're impoverished but we're going to see how that works out. And maybe you'd like to chime in and share some things concerning your own contentment or your own discontentment. And, you know, we can, we can talk about these things during the broadcast. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, friends, you're listening live to the Grace Hour on this Wednesday morning. That wraps up the devotional that we'll share with you, our listeners. Again, joining us in the studio today. Uh, Pastor Wright, and he will stay with us, and we'll open the phone lines, and if you would like to direct a question to us here in our studio among, along the lines of this uh, all-important subject, um, please feel free to do so. Phone lines are now open, 800-338-7060, that's toll-free, and that is in all of North America, and if you're here in the Baltimore area specifically, you can call us on that local number. 410-483-3700. And we just want you to know that if you call, we will be content. <laughs> if you don't call, we well, will be content. We'll still be content. Yes. But we would love to hear from you. And your phone calls really do add to the broadcast. And don't think for a moment that what you have to share is not important or significant. It is. And it may be that your portion will really minister to others that are tuning in and listening to the broadcast around the globe. So we look forward to hearing from you. Fill up those lines. Now is a good time for you to dial one of those numbers so that we, uh, in case we do get a little bit of a, well, you know, kind of a, a traffic jam in terms of our phone calls, we'll be able to get your calls in right away. Uh, thank you for all of you that are listening live on gracehour.org, YouTube Live, Facebook Live. A number of you have reached out to us and shared some comments with us 
Our good friend Dietmar uh, has written, says, a person who wants quick riches will get into trouble. That's from Proverbs 28:20, 20, the B part in the New Living Translation. And that's, uh, that's an insightful thought, isn't it, Pastor? A person who wants mm. quick riches will get in trouble. That sounds like the lottery to me. <laughs> <laughs> a dollar and a dream, but they don't tell you that the dream is actually a nightmare. You know, that's... <laughs> can be. It can be. But, you know, the idea of quick riches, like we, we live two things, I think. We live in a instant, you know, society, instant mentality, instant oatmeal, instant, you know, uh, you know milk, whatever. And, but the second thing is that we also live in a disposable mindset. You know, if, it, if we don't like it, well, we, you know, we'll just throw it in the trash, you know, or, you know, we'll get another one had this for two years and you know, that's too long, whatever the case may be. But I think what Deepmart is saying is so true. I mean, he's quoting the Bible, of course, but how often we would say if, it, you know, think of this. So Jesus calls his disciples and he doesn't tell them how long they're going to be walking with him. You know, I mean, is it today? Is it next week? Well, Lord, how about a week, maybe a month with you would do it. And uh, no, it's going to be three and a half years. What? Three and a half years. That's like, think of all the fish I could catch in that period of time. And so people think that, you know, God is just like, you know, Cinderella, you know, bang, you know, this is, this is going to happen. And, you know, I prayed about it. And 15 minutes later, I don't have the answer. Well, that's the wrong mindset. I think that we need to understand that God is in eternity. We are the ones that are in time. So we're measuring everything by the clock, whereas with the Lord, you know, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So how do we, you know, like, can we get on that page and walk with him in it? Hmm. Such a good question. And we hope that you've got similar questions, friends. We want to hear from you. Um, I want to go back to our, our thoughts or the thoughts that you shared with us about uh, godliness um, and the way godliness is connected with contentment mm. and how it's so profitable, it's great gain. But how does godliness with contentment impact our emotions? Well, I thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, David, David had um, his mighty men, okay, the 30 mighty men. Well, where did those guys come from? Well, they all came to meet up with David in the cave of Adullam. And it says in 1 Samuel 22, 2, that they, they, they were the triple D crowd. Okay, <laughs> triple D. They were in distress, <clears throat> number one. Number two, they were in debt. And number three, they were discontented. And I was very, very interested in what this word discontented in the Old Testament actually was. What word was used? Because we, we kind of could think of it as an emotional feeling, okay? Because our emotions do feel. But what, what was being initiated to the emotion? Because the emotions are responders to what is initiated to them. Well, the word here is the same word for Mara, bitter, bitter. And bitterness can be internalized. It can be hidden. You don't see it necessarily all the time or acknowledge it all the time, but it's there. It's just under the surface. And you all remember Ruth, you know, after um, Naomi had lost her husband and her two uh, sons and, uh, you know, the disaster that had occurred to her life. And so when she went back, she said, do not call me Naomi, which means pleasantness, she said, call me Mara. I am bitter because why? The Lord has dealt heavily with me. Well, that was her perspective from, you know, just her immediate emotions. But the truth of the matter is that God's plan had a provision. And even though, you know, uh, Naomi couldn't see it initially, as it began to unfold with, Nate, with Ruth going to Boaz's field and the relationship that was going to come of that, 
she, I mean, it was, it was totally a grace restoration. And I like to think that though people can get off base and get covetedness, you know, can rule their lives because that's, that's what it's saying that um, there's this desire for something that one doesn't have. Well, you say, well, she lost her husband and her sons, and that's a terrible thing. Yes, that is. Okay. But what did she also have? She had a birthright, and she also had a field, and she also had a kinsman redeemer. And these are the things that sometimes we go blind to (laughs) and not knowing what we already do have because we're busy emotionally pursuing what we don't have and that's what produces discontentment Hmm. sounds like we have to ponder our our blessings a lot more than we ponder our complaints wow why not yeah you know like why do we you know we it's our humanity that wants to dwell on our insufficiency but in our in our need and this is why it says so beautifully the lord is my what helper helper he's there to uh, he's the one that makes the difference in any of our lives. Let's take our first caller. Okay. It's uh, George joining us from the Baltimore area, Middle River to be specific. George, welcome to the broadcast. Go right ahead, sir. Hi, Pastor Love. Hi, Pastor Wright. Yes, George. God bless you, son. God bless you. Beautiful words shared there, Pastor Wright. And while you were sharing it, I was thinking of these two songs, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, and count your blessings. <laughs> wow. You want to sing yeah. those for us? <laughs> leaning. Hey, 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 hey. He was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. Not bad. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you. Count your blessings. Count one by one. By one. Yeah. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Done. Finished. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. 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 And I think that's so important, you know, like uh, when, you know, I love what you said when you got up this morning and what you confessed, you know, and like uh, that's where, you know, contentment comes in, you know, when we can get up and just confess the Lord and just count on blessings. You know, here we are. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, uh, you know, I was sitting in the chair last night in the, in the living room and just looking around and just just kind of thanking God just for, hey, thank you, Lord. You know, I got a roof over my head. You know, I'm sitting here in air conditioning and it's very hot outside. <laughs> you know, it's like, you yeah. know, just, just, just those things like that are just so important, you know, to just thank God for, for, for each and every blessing that we do have, you know. And once we do that, our spirit just takes on a, you know, just a positivity comes flowing out of it, you know, like, you, you know, it's just like, you know, your whole mindset changes, you know, peace floods in. And, you know, it's just, you know, contentment. It's it's just, you know, it's just such an important subject. It really is. It really is. Wow. I love the way you said, you know, the issue of peace, you know, comes flooding in. And um, because James chapter three talks about this and, and along sides of, you know, discontentment. And um, in verse 14, it says, but if you have bitter envying and here's where this this takes place okay so you said you know i could either you know be thankful you know i got a roof over my head i got air conditioning or i could complain about the heat okay now there's no middle ground george you know if i'm if i'm not thankful i'll find something i could complain about you know and (laughs) skip the fact or forget the fact that i have the provision that i do have because there's something going on, you know, that I can't control and I can't deal with. But um, James talks about it. He says it like this in verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and stop lying against the truth. What is the truth? The truth is who Christ has made us to be and that he is our provision and our helper moment by moment. Amen. It's beautiful. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, it's so good much. living. It's great, great living. Grace living. Yes. Grace living. Yeah. There we go. Grace living. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a great <laughs> thought that you, you bring up, George, about counting your blessings, because it's, it's something I think naturally we don't have a tendency to think about 
often because mm-hmm. again, you know, if if we're not walking by faith, then the only other alternative is we're walking by sight. Mm-hmm. And if we walk by sight, we can begin to make this improper evaluation that well, let me give you an illustration. You know, Jacob in the Old Testament when he looked at what had happened to Joseph and then when his sons were forced to go into Egypt to buy grain because of a famine and then they returned and they explained to their father that this cruel, evil, uh, authoritarian kept their youngest brother, Benjamin. Uh, Joseph, I mean, I'm sorry, pardon me, Jacob said, everything is against me. When in reality, everything was working together for his good. Um, yeah. But you can't see that unless you learn to walk by faith. In other words, something happens today. Some terrible news strikes any one of us or any one of our listeners today. Uh, the natural reaction is, why is this happening? Why would God allow this to happen? But the spiritual response would be, I, I don't understand it at this moment, but I have a promise from God. And that promise is all things are going to work together for my good. And I'm going to believe that all things are of God. And I'm also going to believe that all things are for my sake. So I'm not going to react in the flesh. I'm going to respond to God in the spirit. And I'm going to wait upon God. And I'm actually going to stay grateful. I'm I'm going to keep my eyes open, spiritually speaking, to the blessings that I have. I'm not going to focus on what I don't have. I'm going to thank God for the things I do have. Amen. That's beautiful, Pastor. Thank you. Thanks, George, and thanks for the singing. Um, yes, you know, it, it, keep practicing. Yeah, yeah, it, definitely keep practicing. <laughs> yes, I will. God bless you, sir. Love you. All oh, right, phone well. lines are open. Eight hundred three three eight seven zero six zero is the toll free number, and locally it's four ten four eight three three seven zero zero. You know, you said something quite, um, quite important there, Pastor, because. Um, you know, the idea of, of focusing, what am I focusing on at any given time? Well, James goes further on to talk about the two kinds of wisdom that are operative in, in the earth today. And he cites that the wisdom that um, comes from beneath, okay, that it, this wisdom descends not from above. And let's think of this. Wisdom is not intelligence. It's not IQ. It's not ability. It is a system of doing things. It is, it is a, a modus operandi. It is how people function or how you know, things happen. And so he says here that the wisdom that's from the, you know, down below here, the natural wisdom is earthy, sensual, sense-oriented, and demonically inspired or demonically energized. So here's, uh, you know, here's a person, like you said, who's walking by sight. What is that? That is the modus operandi of the world system. Show me, you know, show me the money. Show, you know, Missouri, show me state. Well, the issue here is that the only thing that prevents any of us from not walking by sight is not <laughs> closing our eyes, but opening our eyes to the promises. Now, you cited particularly some verses Okay, and those verses are promises. And when I meditate and have that as my provision, the word of God becomes my provision, then I can think apart from wisdom that comes from below. Mm. And I'm thinking from wisdom that comes from above, you know, and it's beautiful. Yeah, amen. Thank God for the wisdom that he does impart to any and all of us that desire it, that want it. Mm-hmm. We can have it. Yes. James says, ask, it. ask. Amen. And in many cases, we don't have it because we don't ask for it. Wow. Uh, what a tragedy that is. You know, um, Marion writes, uh, if I won the lottery, I would immediately thank God and share it with the church, my family, and friends. Um, yeah, I, I hope and pray that every <laughs> believer would have the same <laughs> attitude. But I sometimes wonder, Pastor Wright, that if, you know, and I don't buy lottery tickets. I don't, you know, play the lottery. Um, and I'm not making a, a judgment upon anybody that does. I just wanted to, you know, for the, for the record to say I don't do it. But every time when I see people 
purchasing those tickets, I do say to them from time, well, I don't say it all the time, but from mm-hmm. time to time I say, I hope you win. Mm-hmm. You know, I hope you're blessed. I hope, you know, that this gives you a, 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 a more positive outlook in your life, you know. But yet at the same time, um, riches have a tendency or at least the potential to blind us. Yes. I mean, it's okay to be blessed financially. The danger exists when we cross the line and we start to love money. You know, Jesus never said that money is evil. He said that loving it, that's the root of all evil. I think sometimes that portion of Scripture is misquoted. You hear it, people say it all the time, money's the root of all evil. Yes, it's that's not. True. That's right, yeah. It's when you love it. It's kind of like the Pharisees. You know, Jesus said about them, he said, you know, you love to sit in the chief seats. Mm-hmm. Is there anything wrong with one of the chief seats? No. If you sit there, are you blessed? Sure. But do you love them? Mm-hmm. Are you discontented when you get a seat that's not a chief seat? Mm-hmm. These are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. And I do think that, I don't know, I sometimes wonder if God hasn't protected us from becoming wealthy. I know some people, they, they use their wealth to glorify God. That's they right. use their wealth to promote God's kingdom. Mm-hmm. They use their wealth to support to support the work of God around the globe, and I think that that is amazing. I feel like that is just as much a calling for a successful businessman to be able to use that financial success and to, and to help God build his kingdom here on the earth as a man is called to God in the work of the ministry. Well, that's so true, Pastor, and isn't it interesting that within the context of our portion here godliness with contentment is great gain james goes on to say timothy rather goes on to say that in verse 10 is the love of money that is the root of all which while some coveted after so you see it's the it's the coveting and remember what we said uh about coveting is and and you know the the idea of like taking my eyes off of what I do have and now pursuing. So I put my dollar down, okay, and, you know, it could be my next to the last dollar, but I'm going to put my dollar down and because I want that, I want a million. Give me back a million. You know, that's, that's a, a windfall. But um, how about the contentment that I can go and work and provide for my family and uh, you know, have a have a beautiful, you know, consistent life in in this life as a household. You know, God's God's into like you know living peaceably amongst all men, and He can provide that. But if I'm anxious and scraping and bucking and contending and trying to get something else, you know, this is why it says, you know, um, but they that fall that will be will to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and hurtful lusts. There Mm. you go. Mm. So maybe I can't, I cannot handle, I don't have a capacity to be wealthy like that. But like you said, there, there are those that are, and they know what to do and they sleep good at night and it's okay. Yeah. I know when you think of, of riches and wealth, I mean, it's like a it's like a two edged sword. It can be mm. a, a great blessing mm-hmm. that God can use, and if you're a good steward of it, uh, it you can be used greatly by God. But then, the other side of that two edged sword is it can pierce themselves through with many sorrows, and that's why I think there's even a television show. There's even some kind of a television show that talks about or that uh, shows us what happens to people that win the lottery and all of the demise and all of the heartache and all of the trouble and all of the problems that follow. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's shocking to me because you would think that, you know, these people are hoping to win the lottery and that's going to solve all their problems. Um, And it's, it's everything that they hope for. I mean, they cannot wait to, you know, go into the boss's office and say, I quit, Um, (laughs) you know, and then go out and spend their riches. But it doesn't quite work out that way. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy because, all of a sudden you'll find out how many nephews, cousins, and, you know, distant family that you, oh, I heard you hit the lottery. Hi, I'm your second cousin. And, uh, (laughs) you know, can you share a little bit of that with me? We're family, you know? So, and then there's always the, 
the so-called, you know, the investors or people that want to help you do something with that million. I mean, it's unseen when we don't have it. We don't know what comes with it. And uh, so we just need to have wisdom from God. Thank you, Lord. Deliver me from vanity. Is it is it my vanity that wants those things? Or and, and, and you know, the big lie says, well, you know, if you had a million dollars, you, you just would be the happiest guy on the planet. And that's not guaranteed. Yeah. That's just not guaranteed. It, it is. There is a message everywhere in the Bible where, where God just seems to, to say to us uh, and hope that we learn this valuable lesson. Don't trust stuff. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, what's the, you know, uh, the alternative that God says, trust me. Mm. Don't trust stuff. Y- you think of Achan in the Old Testament after the children of Israel um, went to Jericho. I mean, there was very clear and specific instructions given to Joshua and the children of Israel regarding that city. And it was simply, you know, you, I'm going to give you this city. The walls are going to come down. It's going to be yours. But don't take the gold. Don't take the Babylonian garment. Um, in other words, just leave the stuff. Don't mm-hmm. worry about the stuff. Mm-hmm. Just keep trusting me. And, of course, there was a man who thought otherwise, and Aiken was his name, and he, he did some Aiken after he made that bad decision, to be, to be <laughs> oh, sure, but he thought, you know what, I'll just take this just in case there's a rainy day, just in case things don't work out mm. well in our, you know, going into inhabit this land that God has given us. You know, just, it's, it's, I'm sure it's going to be insignificant, it's not going to matter at all, nobody's going to know it's going to be a secret. Well, it didn't work out that way mm-hmm. at all, did it? His sin was discovered. God kept the children of Israel from moving forward until that sin was identified and judged. And I think the message behind it, as God was leading his people into taking this land, it was the beginning. Yes. Was Very don't, beginning, yes. don't trust stuff. Because the, the parallel is found in the New Testament when the church age begins And you have in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira who sell their land or their property and their stuff and bring the money and lay it at the feet of the disciples, but say to themselves, they're going to keep back a portion of this for themselves. Could be a rainy day coming in the church age, just in case things don't work out. And again, God dealt very harshly with them. And I think the message, whether it's with Joshua in the Old Testament or the disciples in the New Testament with Ananias and Sapphira, I don't want you to trust stuff. Uh, here's the valuable, valuable lesson you've got to learn. Learn to trust me. Yes, and there then gives me wisdom to handle it properly so it doesn't handle me. I mean, it can. And, you know, people get, um, it's just interesting. I, I, I recently was in a situation where, you know, someone had passed away and and left, you know, to the family a substantial amount of money. And what I witnessed was brothers and sisters, like with horns coming out of their head toward each other. And I thought, like, come on, you guys, you know, like, (laughs) you know, why go down that road when you can, you know, it's coming to you. What what you're going to get is going to, you're going to get, it's okay. Don't forfeit which you already have as family, brothers and sisters, for a, for a buck or two. You know, that's like, that's, wow. that's how we think, you know, naturally speaking. And that happens a it lot. Does. Yes. When it we does. see, you know, loved ones pass away and then families, um, well, they're, they're, they're thrown into this divisive mm. situation mm. where they begin to turn on one another. Yeah. And the unity that once maybe characterized that family is, is ruined and destroyed in some cases for a lifetime. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. So it brings us back to this great principle that we're talking about today with this godliness with contentment. Contentment. The content of our soul is that the Lord is my helper. And like what you were saying about, um, you know, just keeping back some of the money, you know, Ananias and Sapphira or Aiken, you know, thinking that, you know, he, you know, he was going to just keep something for himself and his family, that's, that's exhibiting, you know, in a measure, a lack of trust that I think I know better. 
or I think I know what I'm doing. I think I got the right angle on this. And let me tell you, I mean, in these days coming up and what's happening presently uh, in the world, you know, people need to be careful. That's why I like uh, Marion saying, God loves a cheerful giver, a cheerful giver. And one of the things I thought about that, Pastor Love, about a cheerful giver is like, if I can be happy to give five dollars, then God could trust me with $5,000 because I'll just have the same, you know, attitude, hard attitude of giving regardless of whether I have a little or whether I have a lot. And that's the key. That's the, that's the indication. Can I, do I have liberty when I have a little or do I have liberty when I think I got a lot? But you know what happens is like I, I want to keep more than I want to give. You know, that's so. And, and Jesus said it. He said if you, if you can learn to be faithful in that which is little, in the least, then you will be given more. Yes. Yeah. You can be wow. entrusted with it. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. It's all about being a good steward, isn't it? Of whatever it is that God gives us. And, oh, and he's just looking for, you know, good stewardship. Even when it comes to the grace of God, we're told in first Peter five to learn what it means. Or I'm sorry. First Peter chapter four to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We could ask ourselves, maybe not so much, how am I handling my money, but how am I handling the grace of God wow. that's been entrusted to me Mm -hmm. how am i handling mercy how am i handling forgiveness these things these are good questions to ask ourselves well audrey uh has a great question she says hi there i I need some clarity is tithing an old testament command or does it still stand today someone was telling me according to the new testament we live by grace not under the law what's your take on this well audrey you know the law people people are so afraid of thinking that they're doing something out of legalism. Well, what is what is le- legalism is when I do anything pertaining to God from the energy of the flesh. Why? Because it's beginning with me. It starts with me, what I can do or what I can't do. But law also embraces principles. Let me give an example, okay? The law of gravity. Well, how does that work? Well, it works the same at just about everywhere on the planet, okay? And do we need the law of gravity? Yes, we do. Without it, you know, a whole lot of things would not be happening as we would anticipate them. So I think that the principle of tithing falls under this category. God has entered into an an agreement with us. And I want you to think of it like this. Instead of thinking, this is how often some folks may think, God is asking for 10%. You know, I can't afford the 10%. So I don't, I don't want to have to tithe, okay, because I have needs. And, of course, we all can understand that. But think of it like this. If you and I were to go into a business arrangement, Pastor Love, I mean, and if we were business partners, pretty much so we would, we, you know, draw up a contract and say, you know, we'll split the profits 50-50. Okay, that's good. God says, I want you to enter into my contract through tithing, where I'm going to give you 90% and be a steward of 90% and the 10% is mine. I mean, it's like, it's all his anyway, (laughs) but he entrusts us with a, an an inordinate amount of that, you know, those resources. Think of that. I mean, if any of us could go into a business arrangement and you know, my business partner said, you know, hey, you get 90, I get 10. He said, where do I sign? You know, it's like, that's, that's amazing. That's so good. So I don't think it, that it's like Old Testament, New Testament. I think it's a matter of trust and, and entering into a relationship that God wants to be involved in my finances as much as he wants to be involved in my salvation and my eternal destiny, you know, that he's provided for me. So it's a matter of trust. Yeah, it is. And I think that that Old Testament standard, that tithe, is, is, is good for believers because there are so many believers that are asking the question, well, what is, what is God looking for? You know, can he give me some help? Can he lend me some understanding? So the tithe becomes a good standard. But listen, you're right, Audrey. We are under grace. We're not under the law. We're under grace. And what does grace do? It tells us that we can give beyond that. That's right. In other words, we don't have to be restricted to that tithe, that Old Testament principle of the tithe. We can go beyond that. So it is grace giving, 
And you would like to believe that when the grace of God has been manifested to your heart, <laughs> you'd be able to give, you know, with a cheerful heart in an abundant fashion. Wow. There's yeah. no holding you back. There's no saying, God has especially blessed me, but I'm obligated only to give 10%. No, no. <laughs> You can yeah. give as the Spirit of God leads you. Well, see, that uh, the grace of God does liberate me from the constraints of the law. You know, that if I'm towing the line, if I'm crossing my T's and dotting my I's, then I'm a good Christian? No, I am free to obey as God would lead, because maybe he just might say, okay, in a, in a given situation. So there's actually, in the scriptures, there's three kinds of, you know, giving. There's the tithe, okay? Then there's the free will offering, okay? I'm totally free, no, no obligation. And then there's the sacrificial giving, which comes up. And yeah, that might bite into my, my, you know, my confidence a little bit or bite into my money a little bit. But it, it, when it occurs, it's because God has a provision. Not only, you know, if you lend to the poor, you've given to the Lord. Oh, come on. Well, okay, I see that. But you see, if I didn't have that truth in my heart through the scriptures, I wouldn't see the connection. And I would say, well, you know, like I got to hold, like Aiken, I got to hold on to this and make, make provision for a rainy day. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is interesting because when you hold something firmly in the grasp of your hand, um, no matter what it is, it can't be increased. The mm -hmm. only way it can be increased is when you open your hand. Wow. So there's a wonderful blessing behind giving as God leads you. And, you know, we have witnessed um, by the giving of others and perhaps even by our own giving that, yes, when we have given, even in that, that sacrificial way that you described, that God sees it and blesses us abundantly as a result of it. And I don't think that that should be the motivation. I don't think right. the motivation should be, oh, I'm going to give this because I want God to give me something even greater. That's not the motivation. The motivation is the Spirit of God is moving us, and we listen to what the Spirit has to say, and we're led of God to do that. And of course, as you said, it goes back to this wonderful, basic, fundamental principle, which is everything I have, God has given me. Mm. What do I have that I haven't received? Wow. Not a single thing. God's given it all by His grace. So. Again, Came I'm into this world turn around and, naked and going out the same way. <laughs> amen. Godliness with, with contentment, great gain. Yes. Thanks, Pastor Wright, and thank you, friends, for joining wow. us. Don't forget okay. our service is tonight, 7 p.m. We hope you can make it. Uh, we're going to have a great time of worship and fellowship together. It starts at 7 right here at the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore. Until tomorrow, friends, may God bless you.